second verse, Joshua 4, 4 through 7. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan. And each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, <coughs> What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Okay, and this is what we are doing. We are looking at the events, the lessons of the past. They then form memorial stones for people of the future. Everywhere I go, uh, I'm very, very encouraged. Literally all over the world, people are, are watching this series. And uh, many of them are they're finding out things they've never known. So I'm glad that uh, we are doing this series. We're going to look today at our fellowship in Asia. I told you uh, early on when we first even began planting churches, my father's heart was he was always looking for new harvest fields. Of course, in early days, that was very close. He was scouting out Cottonwood, Wickenburg, you know, Tucson, different places that were close by. I told you about going on family vacations, uh, Nogales, that was my dad was always looking, where could the gospel be preached in a new area? Now, as we began to plant churches and as we began to plant churches internationally, he had the same heart, only now that was expanded, of course, in a much wider worldwide dimension. One of the things that my father wanted, he understood that some of the largest harvest fields in the world are in Asia. The two most populous nations in the world are China and India. And so uh, when we started planting internationally, my father naturally, his heart was looking forward to uh, how could we reach Asia. I have a, uh, a report from the trumpet. And here this is my father with a number of other pastors actually traveled to Hong Kong and China. This was the first trip that anyone from the fellowship had made and the whole point of this was looking how could we reach and in this you can see they went to Macau, they went to Hong Kong and then they went into uh, the area off the top of my head it would be probably around Guangzhou in that area looking someday we want to plant churches there. So we're going to talk about Asia, and I want you to keep in mind now something. Any of the nations that we're going to discuss here, they are predominantly communist, Muslim, or Hindu nations in which, in all these cases, it is actually illegal to preach the gospel there. So how... Can you reach nations when it is illegal to do so? Jesus gave ancient wisdom in Matthew 10, 16. I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Okay, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. That, that is a powerful bit of wisdom that still applies today. So Jesus is saying... How should you approach difficult situations like a snake? Now, some people, they are snakes. That's a different sermon. That's not what I'm talking about. He said, like a snake. How does a snake move? They don't have legs. They maneuver. Jesus is giving very important wisdom. How do you reach a Muslim nation, a communist nation, a Hindu nation when it's illegal? You maneuver. You have to. There are certain laws in place. We're going to have to maneuver around them. And then he says, harmless as doves. Let me emphasize uh, something. When we go into a place where the government is not favorable, if that's because of communism, Muslim, or Hindu, we are not sending workers there to get involved in politics. We are not there to change governments. I have no interest in that. That is not 
why we are there. We are there harmless as doves. We're there to change hearts, not governments. Okay, and that is how there have been people that they have gotten caught up and they want our churches to become a, a anti-government political force that is not going to help us, that's going to hurt us. You maneuver, you remain harmless, therefore you're able to reach these. So China, the first Asian nation that we were able to reach was the nation of uh, China, in 1987, a couple out of Tempe went to the city of Xiamen in mainland China. We have a trumpet report. This just tells about it. There are some photos uh, at the bottom there. This is uh, what they call an underground Bible study at a hotel. Underground just simply means hidden. You're, you're doing this in secret in, in uh, one way or another, and that was 1987. 1988, a couple from uh, the church in Perth, West Australia, that Lisa and I are, are from, Ross and Karen Barcham, who was able to get a job in the city of Shenzhen as English teachers. I have a picture of Ross and Karen. They actually have a lengthy uh, ministry in China in various uh, different ways. I think this photo is actually later on when they went to Hong Kong, but I'm just showing you uh, who they are, and so they went in 1988. Also in 1988, my father wanted to reach China so much, our own Don Galati was able to get a job teaching in Shenzhen. And we have photos when, you're, when we put up online, there is our man in China, is that he got a job teaching, and this gave him open doors to be able to witness and preach the gospel. He did this and uh, many doors were open there. He's baptizing in the bathtub and uh, that uh, he was able to do this. And so you'll see, when you're able to see all of the trumpets online, you'll see that Don was able to move around because dad wanted to do, what can we do? And that was an open door. So Don was able to go uh, for some time in China witnessing holding Bible studies, and uh, doing something for God. 1989, Bob and Susan Mammon from our congregation, they went to a place called uh, Chicago. Uh, it was very responsive. There, because of communism, there was no way at that time to rent a building, and so they simply started building a church in their uh, apartment. Have some pictures here. Uh, this is them laboring in their apartment, you'll see Don uh, came to visit. Don's in the right-hand corner. Uh, Mark Olson came and preached. He's in the bottom right corner, but you see Bob with a, a group of people. There's Susan in the bottom. This is the left-hand photo, and uh, you see them laboring, very, very responsive. He said that he met a man who spoke good English, was able to be his interpreter. He wanted an English name, so he named him Abraham. And he said most of the people who came, they wanted English names. Some of them, you know, they helped pick one. But there were people, they had already chosen an English name. So he said at their Bible study or at the church they were building there, George Bush and Madonna attended. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> which is actually better in later years. I know in Africa, there's numbers of people, Hitler came to uh, churches and Bible studies, that's a, a different thing. But God helped them. He said that because of the response, even in their, uh, they were only there for one year, but got about 25 to 30 people coming. And again, the only option, we believe in water baptism. He said most of those people that came prayed for salvation. They wound up getting baptized in their bathtub. And they obeyed the Lord in that. Later on, Mark and Carol Tozer uh, came to Chicago. I think we have a photo of them in the same area. And uh, they came in and labored at the same time. 1990, the Barchums were deported from mainland China. They got caught preaching and ultimately they deported them. And so they went to Hong Kong. And uh, if you understand geographically, Hong Kong was just across the water, 
Back then, Hong Kong was under British control. They had signed a uh, 100 year, 75 or 100 year lease from China, and so the British actually controlled it. So they simply went across to Hong Kong and started a, a work there. So there's a lesson that I want to give you. This is important, and there will be people watching online that uh, this is actually a not uncommon problem. We send people that they are, God has put on their heart a certain place or we have chosen a place for them to go, but then it just simply doesn't work out. We have some people are never able to get in because of visa problems. We have people like the Barchams that for various circumstances they have to leave. This is the place we intended on being and they go. So here's the lesson. God directs people through negative circumstances. See, what, what I'm weaving in through all of these stories, this is not a work of God, or a work of man, rather. It's a work of God. God is in control. So I'm telling you all the different ways that we wind up having churches. Sometimes we have churches in places because of negative circumstances. It wasn't our plan to go there. But a door was shut. That's actually a biblical principle. Sometimes I've had missionaries that we send and they are, they're blitz, they're freaked out in their mind because I, I, we were announced I was supposed to go here but I can't get a visa or, or we got ran out of town, the police or immigration or whatever. So how does that fit in the will of God? It fits perfectly. God's in control of everything. Don't you think God knew that before you went? So what we see in the book of Acts uh, chapter 16 is that uh, Paul and the, the team, they were, uh, Paul and Silas were in uh, Philippi. They are arrested, they're beaten, ultimately they are run out of town. They had started a work, Lydia, the demon-possessed girl, Lydia's family, they all got saved. God was starting a work and now the authorities are forcing them out of town. The Apostle Paul didn't quit and say, well, then I guess God lost. He moved on to Thessalonica and started another church. So it was God's will. He knew that that would happen. Negative circumstances sometimes lead us to the work of God. Here's another uh, lesson that I, I want to give you, and this is important in a local church. God directs people through involvement. Okay, discipleship. The training of workers for the ministry, very important part of discipleship. You have to be inspired. You have to sense uh, the, the call uh, to uh, ministry in some way. If God is calling you to preach in that way, discipleship involves instruction. There are things you learn. It may involve correction if you need correction. One of the powerful parts of discipleship, someone who wants to do a, will of, a work for God, you need to get involved in ministry in some way. I have disciples, they get stirred at a conference, discipleship class, whatever it might be. Pastor, I, I want to do something for God. I, I feel called. What should I do? You should get involved. You cannot be a disciple if you're not involved in ministry in some way, and you need to work with people because it is working with people that you learn lessons. There's nothing like working with people to learn lessons about ministry and people and learn about yourself. But here's the point that I want to make as it concerns Asia. Sometimes our involvement will give you direction for future ministry. Perth, West Australia, the church that uh, Lisa and I were originally sent out of, Australia is an extremely multicultural society. It is made up of many immigrants. I told you years ago when I, uh, when Lisa and I were pastoring in, in uh, Melbourne, the area of Footscray, back then I think we had 35 nationalities. And I'm not talking about people who say, I have 132nd Cherokee blood. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people directly from different nations. So what happened in the church in Perth, at that time it was located in an area called Scarborough, near the beach, 
that Asians started getting saved. This is often what happens. You'll have waves of different nationalities or cultures that come through at any given time. Asians started getting saved in the church. Two couples in the church, Brian and Angie Rowenfelt, they began following up on Asians, if they were from China, Indonesia, wherever they were from, various places. They started following up on them, forming relationships with them, working with them, and then out of that, they started doing outreaches to reach more Asians in different ways. Uh, another couple, it's actually uh, Brian's brother-in-law and sister, Bob and Megan Matthews. Another couple, Trevor and Priscilla Fong. He was my roommate before I got married. These were three couples that all got involved with Asians. They were simply following up, but there was an entire group. We have some pictures uh, here, and you'll see on the left, uh, the top row uh, in the center, that's Brian Roenfeld. Next to that is his brother-in-law, uh, Bob uh, Matthews, bottom left, that is Trevor Fong, used to be my roommate, and these are some of the Asian converts that God originally uh, was saving. The bottom, the picture on the right, there are the Matthews and the Rowenfelts with some Asian converts. So they simply started working because everybody who gets saved needs someone to befriend them, but out of that, they started getting a heart for Asians, for Chinese people, Malaysian people, whatever nationality they were, and they wanted to reach them. <clears throat> 1991, both the Rowenfelts and the Matthews, they got jobs teaching English in the city of Guangzhou. Guangzhou is the first city when you cross from Macau, it's the closest city to, uh, or not Macau, rather Hong Kong. It's the closest city in mainland China. And so they got jobs. Again, how can you operate in a nation that is communist, anti-Christian? You maneuver, remember? Wise as serpents. So they got jobs teaching English. I have a photo now. Is uh, There's Brian and Angie at the top. These are some of their first converts that they got, so now they're teaching English, but using English as a way to preach the gospel now to communist Chinese. They got a group of converts, you see some of uh, them there. They were there for one year only, and then Brian's contract to teach was canceled. I don't remember if that was actually because of um, his gospel work, but nonetheless, so this was his first foray into an Asian nation. It was in Guangzhou. Another Australian couple took over uh, for a short time and then ultimately a couple from Holland, Rene Brabants and his wife, uh, took over that work that had been started initially by the Rowenfelts and did a, a, a good job. The Brabants get, got a good solid group of people together in uh, Guangzhou. It was small, but it was solid. Then another couple ultimately came and took over. Uh, Hank and Sanita Bruce came from Holland and they took that church over in Guangzhou. And now that God began to really do something good, the church in in uh, Guangzhou began to do well. Someone from an area called Dongguan came through, I don't remember if they met him on the street or if it was a, a contact or a friend of someone in Guangzhou, but they came from Dongguan, which was 45 minutes away, and they got saved. And so now began asking, would you come to Dongguan and uh, preach to my family and, and my friends. And so for quite some time, uh, uh, the Bruces were ministering in two churches at the same time. He would minister several times a week in Guangzhou. He would minister also in Dongguan. 
And in both cities, they began to grow and began to do well. Eventually, you can't do that forever. And another couple, uh, Franz Smits and his wife, came and took the church in Dongguan. But it was in Guangzhou, that original church that the Roenfelts had pioneered, that is where our work in China really began to take off. Other people were pioneering, they were plowing, but in Guangzhou, uh, you know, this Dutch couple, they did very, very good. And the most important part of them being there, everywhere we go to start a work, we are not there just to get people saved. We are not there just to build a church. We're there to make disciples. And that is especially, making disciples is the real key to reaching any nation. Because that is ultimately the answer. If, if China has over a billion people, it would be impossible for us to send enough missionaries to reach the whole nation. What really has to happen, to reach the entire nation, you have to have Chinese disciples, and then, of course, looking ahead, using common sense in any Muslim, communist, or Hindu nation, probably the open door won't stay open forever. Governments change, they crack down. So if you're not making disciples, then your work has the potential of falling apart. Uh, uh, Bert and uh, Gerda Flederes, they came and took the church from the, the Bruces and really did a, a fine job of making disciples. They started planting churches, and that was very powerful, planting the first Chinese couples out. That is a, a, an amazing work. Barton Wilma Koiker, another Dutch couple, came and took over from the Flederes, and uh, then uh, in America, Mark and Diana, Crumpler, they went to China several times as well. So here's a lesson that I want to give you. That is, we must respond to open doors. So we have, and again, I'm weaving through all of these stories, how do we get churches in nations? That can be God speaks. God told Lisa and I to go, told me to go to South Africa. That's one way. You have people that have a natural burden. I have family. I have a passport. I always wanted to go. But one of the things that happens is that in different nations, doors swing open. Doors that are shut because of law, because of politics, communism, religion, Muslim, uh, Islam, or Hindu, uh, Hinduism, they shut doors, they keep Christianity out, but then politics change. The door opens, we must respond when God opens the door. 1 Corinthians 16, 9. For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Okay, this is, Paul is giving his approach to ministry. He says, a great, there's a great opportunity, an effectual or an effective door has been opened. So we operate through the principle of open doors. And that is especially true when you have a nation that was closed. When it opens, God requires us, we must respond to that. And we have to do it quickly because, again, common sense tells you, Doors that are open will not uh, uh, stay open forever. So the original works that I've described to you now, everyone who went into China up, into this, up to this point, they all were operating in an atmosphere of strict control. This is, uh, uh, this is different, remember? Wise as serpents for some Men, they, they chafe at this. They hate this aspect in a communist nation, uh, in a Hindu, in a Muslim nation. It is not wise to approach preaching the gospel exactly like you do in America. In America, we're going to boldly preach. If they come and arrest us, we'll take them to court. We'll fight. By golly, this is, our, this is our rights. That's not how it operates there. And so they're, they teach English uh, clubs. They have different methods 
to preach, but that was generally in an atmosphere of strict control, and you are very wise and, and aware of, of the government being against you. But then China changed. China's doors began to open. They relaxed their stance up until China was a closed nation, the Great Wall of China. That was their that was actually symbolic. It's not just history. That was their symbolic stance towards outsiders. They fear um, uh, outsiders, xenophobia. The, the fear of outsiders is how they operated. And so now the doors open. They relax this. As soon as we saw that the doors were open, we started sending in workers rapidly multiples in the same conference because we recognize it won't stay open let's let's hit it now so what happened is now we could open new ground new cities new provinces and we could make disciples in various uh, different places now I'm not going to please if you're watching this and you were a missionary that labored there i'm not naming names deliberately because there are workers that want to keep going back and preaching and i don't want to i'm not going to show you modern photos there are people right now it would not be healthy for them if i show you all the photos and someday we let the communist police be able to track down everybody that is there so but i recognize there were workers Many workers from the United States, from England, from Australia, from Holland. There were people that we were sending as many as possible, actually as fast as possible. And they, with the goal of making disciples. A wise missionary is one who knows, I am here. I've got to make disciples because I might not be here forever. Doors that were open, then later on they started swinging shut again in various places the government uh, began to crack down and uh, this is this is what would happen in in many of our places they have uh, they may have met in a dozen different church buildings because they would rent one the police would finally catch on come and crack down on them and it is so densely packed, they would move a distance away, rent again and until the police would crack down. They just kept moving. And there are churches that have, they've probably had a dozen buildings or even more uh, because of that. So what started happening is they would crack down. Some of our missionaries got deported. As they would get deported, fortunately, disciples were being made, whether that was in their church or the main church in Guangzhou, Dongguan, had made disciples. And so Chinese workers started taking over these established churches. And then in COVID, uh, COVID was very frightening for, for the missionaries. I, uh, we had to pay a lot of money to get our missionaries out as quickly as possible. COVID was weird for us in China. They were literally putting, the police would come and put locks on the outside of somebody's apartment and lock them in. And so the ability to get food, Chinese people, now the xenophobia comes. In China, they were telling them it was the foreigners who brought COVID. I know some of you, you, you know where it really came from, but uh, it, they said it was the foreigners, so who are they gonna give food, not foreigners? So it's actually very dangerous. Most of our missionaries uh, had to leave during the COVID era. There were a few that were able to hold on. The Barchams were, were back by that time. Uh, he's a dentist, so he had a legitimate job and a reason to be there, but ultimately they had to leave uh, uh, anyway. So the Chinese were taking over. Some of the missionaries that left, there was not enough there were not enough disciples, Chinese disciples, to take all the churches. So some of the pastors for several years kept on meeting with their church over Zoom. They would get up, whatever the time difference, they would preach over Zoom and these people would uh, uh, watch them. But now what's happening, the door is swinging open again. 
And we are currently, you saw in the last conference, we sent three workers because I believe in the principle of open doors. We are going to send as many as we can, as fast as we can, knowing that it won't stay open. And, and hopefully every one of those men will make disciples because that's how we're going to reach China. Right now, there are 24 churches in China and 20 out of 24 are pastored by Chinese couples. And so that is a wonderful thing. Thank God. Let's talk about Malaysia. In Malaysia, we originally did some crusades, many in Africa, uh, India, Malaysia, Philippines. How did we get in originally? We met church uh, pastors and churches from outside of our fellowship. We went and preached for them, trying to get an open door. This is what uh, we did. We have a trumpet report. Here is revival in Malaysia. Uh, all those photos that you see, that's not a fellowship church. That was people that we met, and they would go in and did crusades. Joe Campbell had gone in in a number of these crusades, and he went to, uh, into Malaysia working with several existing pastors. I think I have a photo here. Uh, somewhere in there is Joe Campbell uh, preaching. I care which exact photo. Oh, there he is, bottom left co uh, corner. Uh, I believe that's Joe Campbell, preaching. And so ultimately God spoke to Joe Campbell, you're going to be in Malaysia. And uh, Joe and Connie Campbell did wind up going to Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Malaysia is a Muslim nation. And uh, we have a photo of uh, them there. This is the work. Now you see Petaling Jaya is the neighborhood in uh, Kuala Lumpur metro area. And so Joe is a disciple maker. He was preaching, getting converts, making disciples. He's challenging culture and uh, began. That is where our work in Malaysia began. We were working with other pastors, but ultimately our pastors have to go and to establish and set the pattern for others uh, to follow because of the, the split, the rebellion of 1990. That's our next lesson we're going to look at. Joe had to leave prematurely, had to leave Kuala Lumpur, come back to rescue the, the church in Chandler. And so he nationalized that work in Malaysia. Uh, we now have five churches in Malaysia. And then I'm going to show you a photo. Remember my uh, my... I talked about involvement, Trevor and Priscilla Fong, those earlier photos from the church in Scarborough in Perth, West Australia, working with Asians. Trevor and Priscilla Fong are in Malaysia today. They're preaching the gospel. They have been there uh, a number of days. Indonesia, 1991, the Roenfelds. So the Roenfelds went, uh, they were deported from China and now... He has a heart for Asians by working with them. And so the Roenfelds were sent to Jakarta, Indonesia. Indonesia is the uh, second largest, um, I'm pulling this, it's, it's uh, India, China, and I think, I mean, yeah, India, China, Indonesia would be the third largest Asian nation uh, in the world completely Muslim, but the Roenfelds, God bless them, they have a pioneer spirit and, and he has a heart for people. They were able to build a work, we've got a photo here, able to build a work of uh, about 100 people by the time that they uh, had to leave. They had numbers of other workers uh, came in from Australia originally, Craig and Helen Newton, these are people that Lisa and I went to church with. This is their uh, work. Uh, Craig is a, in the white shirt in the top left photo there. And then here is the church that uh, they were building there. Another Australian couple, Scott and Anna McLean. Uh, they were sent there from, I think, the Bunbury Church, Glenn and Sandra Anderson. Um, they were sent out of Geraldton, Chris and Marcia Razmovsky, Peter and Brenda Cruz, uh, Zach and Zoe Triono. Uh, Zoe is the, the daughter of Peter and Brenda Cruz. 
and uh, her and her husband are now pastoring that church in uh, Jakarta in Indonesia. Brian and Angie Roenfeld, after going numbers of different places, I'll tell other stories. Today they are in Denpasar on the island of Bali in uh, Indonesia, still doing a work for God. Right now we have six churches in the nation of Indonesia. Nepal, in the nation of Nepal, my, my wife's brother, Lisa's brother Carl, in, in Perth, West Australia, a man came into the church and got saved. He was from Nepal. And later, his sister came for a visit, and suddenly from across the Bible study, their eyes met, and uh, Carl and Gita fell in love. Carl married a Nepalese girl named Gita. Have a uh, photo. Uh, try the next one, see if I have it. No, no, I got my photos out of order. I don't know which one that one is. And go one more forward. There you go. That's the photo I was looking for. That is Lisa's brother. Carl Gita uh, is Nepalese, and these are their two children. But because they were saved, here is one of the ways that we get new churches. Now, some of the family are saved in Australia, but they began to pray, God, we need a fellowship church in Nepal. And many times we have churches, this is how they come about. This was true, I told you, in the East Coast, in, in Massachusetts. Some of those works began because people were praying for the place where they're from. This is what happened. Uh, Gita and her family were praying for the work uh, or there to be a work opened in Nepal, and this is what happened in a conference. Uh, Mike and Yolanda Stamper were very stirred. Again, I'm telling you the different ways that churches come about. Some people, God speaks to them a place. He came to me and said, I am very stirred. He told Pastor Mitchell and myself, I'm stirred, but I have no direction where. I'm willing to go anywhere, and knowing that Gita and the family were interested in there being a church in Nepal. I naturally had a church or an interest as well. And I said, what about Kathmandu, Nepal? And so they responded. And this is exactly what happened is Mike and Yolanda Stamper went to Kathmandu, Nepal. They were the first workers there. Go to the next picture. It appears I have them out of order. I think that's actually Indonesia. That's a photo of the Roenfelds. Go to the next one. There we go. Here is uh, early days of the work in uh, Kathmandu, Nepal. I think that is, um, uh, if I remember right, that's the first building. The top left, that's the first building. All of those you see on the front row, those are Gita's family. Uh, my sister-in-law's family, that's, that's them on the front row. Is They now came into the church. They became instrumental. To the bottom left, there is a street outreach uh, that they're doing on the street. Top right, if I remember, that is the second building now. And you can see that God began to do a work uh, there. And this is what happened. Next photo. Uh, here is uh, now, this is the uh, conference in India in 2022. We have two different workers. We sent the porters later on. And so uh, now you, you see our uh, own Paul and Amy Arps are there in the photo. I'm in the middle, and these are all of the delegates from Nepal, different ones, and numbers of those are the family of Gita that originally she prayed, and her and her brother and family were praying for a work in Nepal. And so now you're seeing that God is building a work in Nepal. The nation of Vietnam. In Vietnam... The Roenfelts now, who had been in China, had been in, uh, been in Indonesia, now in 1996, they were sent to Vietnam, and then their partners in crime, Bob and Megan Matthews, this is family, both couples were sent to Vietnam. And uh, if I remember right, it was Hanoi that they went to, initially began to make very good impact, but again, this is a communist nation, and so what began to happen is the police 
plainclothes police followed them everywhere they went. I remember uh, a pastor telling me of going to preach for the Roenfelts in the early days, and he said, it was like being in a spy movie. Quick, hop on the motorcycle, and they're zooming in and out and going down and running down the alley and then meeting secretly. And so that, that's wise as serpents. And so, but it finally became, it was impossible for the Roenfelds. Everywhere they went, the police were following them, making it difficult. So after only six months of building a work, they got converts, they did a, a work for God. After only six months, uh, the Roenfelds were forced to leave Vietnam and went on to India, which we'll get to uh, in a minute. So now, uh, Westerners, they're very suspicious of, I don't know if you remember this, but we were all amazed when Russia planted a worker into Vietnam because who helped Vietnam in the war? Russia. So Americans they're suspicious of, even Australians they're suspicious of because they helped in the war, but Russia, a Russian, I remember like, how smart is God? A, a work in Russia is able to plant and he has no problem. So that was quite novel. But then what happened is from the Philippines, uh, the main church in Mandaluyong, they sent uh, Ramil Cordero and his wife to Hanoi. And it, very, very interesting in, I'm, I'm telling you about God who is in charge. We have a, a photo. I want you to see the next uh, photo. Hopefully I have it in line. If you look at the right, you see two young men here. These two young men, they are Aussies from the city of Adelaide in Australia. They're, I think they're from the Assembly of God. Somehow these young men, their church, I don't think planted missionaries, they wanted to do something for God and somehow in their hearts, these two brothers moved to Vietnam with no support. They're, we want to do something for God and they thought, how can we reach Vietnamese in a communist nation? They opened a coffee shop. And so the Corderos uh, met them. You see uh, Boyette, in, uh, that's the leader in Philippines, talking to these Aussie brothers. When Ramil went and met them, they offered the use of their coffee shop as an English club. This is a way that to, to invite outsiders in without saying it's a church. And so God bless these Aussie brothers who were instrumental in giving them a place to evangelize. And uh, that was very powerful. Next photo, they actually let their, this is in their coffee shop allowing them to meet and you see what they're really doing. They called it an English club, but they're preaching the gospel. And that was wise as serpents, harmless as doves. I am told that those Aussie brothers were so inspired ultimately at what God was doing in the church through our Filipino brothers that they wound up opening their own church. They're not with us, but God bless them. Thank God for people with hearts for uh, the gospel. And so in Vietnam, like China, the door swung open. And when that happened, we started sending workers in and uh, they, uh, the most powerful part is not just having churches, uh, they started making disciples. And Ramil Cordero did an outstanding job in Hanoi, made disciples and started planting churches, started planting Vietnamese couples into Vietnam uh, to reach them. And ultimately, they have now planted even missionary work. Vietnamese workers are in other nations now, preaching the very, very powerful, have a, a photo, they nationalized it. And uh, here's a photo, that is Ramil Cordero. Uh, this is one of, I think that is their first church building that they got. Uh, let's see, what's the next photo that we have? Uh, there's the first baptism. Top left is the very first baptism of the very first Vietnamese converts. Uh, down below, in, when uh, Pastor Boyette came, they had another baptism. All these people got baptized. Those are Vietnamese converts. We now have 13 churches in Vietnam. Have the next photo. And uh, no, that's, that is a new converts class after morning prayer. And one of the things when they, 
the Corderos open, young people, very young nation at that time. And so young people were responding. There is one of their early buildings. God is uh, doing a great work. Next photo. Uh, here is uh, a church. Bottom right is laying hands on uh, Brother Doy uh, and his wife who took over. And uh, they are now the national leaders. They pastor that church. They are the national leaders in Vietnam, which is our ultimate goal. But that door is still open. We are sending workers. We support uh, a work out of Prescott to uh, T.J. Horta and his wife. We, we support them in the city of Da Nang in Vietnam. India. A man was sent from Kenya to India. He lacked character. He had all kinds of problems that I won't go into. So he had to go back in shame to Kenya. The Rowan Feltz. For a while there, we didn't play Where's Waldo. We played Where's Brian Rowanfeld. He's, he's somewhere in the world. And Brian and Angie, God bless them, they moved around, went to India now. And they went to Aurangabad in India where this man from Kenya was supposed to be uh, building a church. We have a photo of Brian. And uh, there is Brian. And uh, these are some of the people in Aurangabad. But he discovered, he said, this church is nothing like our fellowship. It was kind of religious People, so he went and scouted uh, the city of Bangalore that he heard they speak more English there. And he was the first one to scout in the city of Bangalore. Something happened. Joe Campbell was in a restaurant in Malaysia in 1988, and he said all of the waiters were young Indian men, hardworking men from India that had come over for an opportunity, and, and God did something. He wasn't looking at waiters. He saw the potential. He said, if I had a 100 men like that dedicated to the gospel, we could reach India. So God put it in Pastor Campbell's heart, and he said, I want to reach India. Chandler uh, launched the first real full-time work uh, in, into uh, India, the Rowanfelts were only there a short time. His wife uh, was having twin babies and health problems, and, and they had to leave uh, in a very rapid amount of time. But uh, Ashkar and Linda Gafur were sent out of the Chandler Conference to the city of Bangalore, where they began to build a good work. Later, Dan and Monica Rubianis took over that work. We have some photos from the early days, and here is various uh, crusade at the top and middle, uh, early outreach on the right, and, and uh, there is the church on the left. They began to build this work in Bangalore, and then out of India, again, our goal is not simply building churches, it's making disciples, planting churches. From India, they began planting churches, and we have some photos here. Uh, more, you see dad in the middle there with some missionaries, and and uh, a native Indian worker, there's a march on the top right, dad preaching in the conference, giving a challenge, uh, conference in the bottom left and top left. But this was a conference, and they started planting churches. We nationalized the work there, and uh, Paki and Samantha Raj took over there, and now the national leaders in India doing a great job. Missionaries, again, open door. We started sending in missionaries from different nations. It is technically illegal. They have a law. It's against the law to convert a Hindu. This is now a Hindu nation. It's illegal, but we don't say, well, it's illegal, so I guess they all go to hell. Absolutely not. Wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Sometimes there's trouble. You've got to be wise about it. But nonetheless, we do that, have a, a photo. This is from the conference in 2022 where I uh, uh, preached. And uh, so these are all Indian pastors. Now we have 36 churches in the nation of India right now. Isn't that wonderful? Thank God. Thank God. Final nation, I don't have time to do every single nation, but Cambodia, our own John and Aaron Mayola. Uh, the Mayolas are our version of Where's Waldo? Uh, somewhere in the world, the Mayolas always are. And so they were the first one. They pioneered in Cambodia, in Phnom Penh, uh, Cambodia. They were the first ones from our fellowship to go. 
Later, a couple from Russia took that, but other couples have been planted and we're starting to really make impact in Cambodia. And uh, so this is now the Kenyans are in Siem Reap. Uh, there, this is a giant wooden mallet that they have. This is the idol smasher. Because people who get genuinely saved, what did he tell the people in Thessalonica? You turn to God from idols. And so when people genuinely get saved, the idols have got to be smashed. They have got to be burned. And that massive uh, mallet is the idol smasher. Genuine converts, they do that. And we currently have seven churches in Cambodia. We thank God for the work that God is doing there. Final photo I want you to see here is, uh, this is just a picture. I'm showing you different photos from my dad's uh, Bible. And here you can see my dad's writing. This is 2017. He was getting very old and shaky. But this spoke to him, blessed are ye who sow beside all waters that send forth there the feet of the ox and the ass. And he was speaking about church planting. He says, that is our job. That's what we do in Prescott. That is the vision that we have. That is what we've tried to transmit. And thank God there are other churches all around the world that they are sowing beside all waters. Some of the greatest waters in the earth numerically are in Asia and we thank God for what he's doing in Asia. Let's praise God together. Let's thank God for his goodness. God, thank you for what you're doing and thank you that you allow us to be a part of this and thank God. And I'm, I'm very grateful there are, please, I'm skipping very fast. I cannot personally name and give photos of every single person, but please recognize there are workers that they paid a great price especially the first ones in a nation. It's often very difficult on them. I honor every single one of you if you're watching this. I thank God for every missionary that believe and every pastor that sent because we are going to impact Asia for Jesus. Thank God we're going to stop there.